who am I? I know. It's like, it's been so long. Can everybody hear me back there? Yeah. Okay. Um, hey, God is so awesome, isn't he? Yeah. I don't know about you, but today it's, it's been worth coming already. What do you think? So you might as well expect it to be even more worth it now and let the word speak to your heart today because I think he's got a word for all of us this morning. I know he does for me and you just happen to be in the same room. This series on love, wow. It's been pretty great. What do you think? I think Victor's done a wonderful job putting it all out there and challenging us and uh, asking us to assess our own hearts and our own lives. Amen. First big question, am I loving God? Hmm. Okay, that's the first and great question. Because the first and great commandment is what? Love. Okay, so shouldn't the first and great question be am I? And the second is this just so similar. Second and great question would be what? Am I loving my neighbor? So there's your two, uh, you say, what'd you go and learn t at church today? The first and great question. They're going to be like, what church do you go to? I hope they had the answer. Yeah, the word got the answer, that's for sure. Uh, am I loving my neighbor? Am I loving other people in my life? And last week really got to me, personally, do I love my enemy? God is pretty easy to love, isn't he? Some of you are pretty easy to love, too. Some more than others. I take that upon myself. I think I'm just here to be a challenge so that you learn how to love people <laughs> that you may not like so much. So thank you, God. Always have, thank you, God, for opportunities to apply the scriptures in your life. There you go. Now, so God's easy to love. People are pretty easy to love. And it's because he first loved us that we can do either of those. Amen? And he shows us that this verse, I just wanted to remind us of this verse. It says, by this the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent his only begotten son into the world. Where? Where did he send him? The into world. the world. Who's in the world? The People. people. Right. Send him into the world so that we might live through him. This was, there was a method to the madness. God sends Jesus into the world. That's crazy. Because the world didn't want him. But there was an ulterior motive that made it make some sense that we, the world, might live through him. Okay? In this is love, not that we loved God, which is, as we agreed, pretty easy, but that he loved us, which is not very easy. He loved us and he sent his son to be the payment for our sins. And because now he brings it full circle. This verse brings it full circle. Beloved, dearly, people who are dear to God, so dear that he sent Jesus to die for you, you are so dear to him. Beloved, if God did that for us, if he so loved us, what do we owe? We should be able to just close the book and go home. I don't know why we can't. Because this really does bring it all the way full circle. God doesn't deal with us as the enemies that we were, did he? Instead, he who is love turns that love, right? He's love, and he takes that love, the spotlight of the love of God in our undeserving direction through Jesus Christ. Now, the assumption is, if we belong to him, living through him, then we send what we so desperately needed and found in Christ. Now we send that back out into the world, that thing that we needed so desperately, which was love. You get it? It's a full circle kind of thing. So we as the beloved, we who are dear to him, have this debt. And this debt is to love God, to love one another, and to love the folks out in the world that are neither your enemy or your best pal. They're just there to love them. And then we get to the crazy one that mm, I have a real issue with, a loving my enemy. Now. 
But God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were yet what? Who died for us? Christ died for us. So when did God choose to love you? While you were yet a what? Okay, did he wait till you became righteous? Did he wait for you to ask him? Did he wait for you to say, I'm really in trouble and need some help? Did he wait till you got your act together? I can see that. <laughs> no, he and Jesus Christ did this whole sacrificial love thing when we least deserved it. Can I get an amen? Okay? And this is the point that I have a hard time with. I'll take that in my life. Oh, yeah, but I want to take my love and go home. You know? So no, I don't want anybody else playing with that, especially if you're not my friend. Okay? When you become my enemy, and this is my challenge, to love, translate this, be loving. Oh, it's easy to say, oh, I, I, oh yeah, I love them. But am I loving to them. Now, are those two different things many times? Talk is cheap. Amen? Cheap. That's right. I love you. <laughs> I hope they didn't get that on film. There'll be a still shot of that. You know, it's hard to be loving when somebody is being hurting and unloving to you, right? I mean, you know, human nature. Oh, did I just say that? Human nature. Wait, isn't human nature the problem? What we're trying to get is past our human nature and get into a little mm, God nature, spirit nature, Christ nature, okay? And that is what we're going to be talking about a little bit today. How do I love my enemy when they're hurting me and be being my enemy? Wait, 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 wait. Wait, you're telling me I need to love them now? Wait, can't I wait until they say they're sorry? Then I will love them. Bring, come on, right? Hello, let's be honest. Do I have to love them now while they're being mean to me? Can't I wait until they stop being mean to me? Can't I wait till they ask for help? Well, yeah, you're right. No, because we're supposed to be like God. Did God wait for all those things to happen before he loved you? No, he didn't wait for you to stop being a sinner because it still hasn't happened and he still loves us, okay? So we can't wait till somebody stops being a sinner before we choose to love them. Isn't that remarkable? I mean, let's just lay it out there and say this is the way it is because we can teach on, oh, loving your enemies and blah, blah, blah. I am so fine with loving my enemies once they repent. <laughs> and it's so funny because I still think they're my enemy. I just think they're more of a righteous enemy than they were before. Now, Victor did this teaching Sunday, last Sunday. How many, were, were you all here last Sunday when he taught on loving your enemy? Okay. Not many hours after that. I'm telling you, not many hours after this teaching. We heard this sermon on loving our enemies. I got a real up close and personal opportunity to try it out. Isn't that a nice way of saying it? I mean, I'm talking, I was totally sideswiped, lambasted, just like, what? You just, no idea, absolutely, totally sideswiped, out of the blue, by somebody that I know, that I love, totally out of the blue, a phone call from somebody that accused me of doing something that I would never even think about doing had never even thought about doing. I could tell you exactly, I had every alibi on the planet that I didn't do it. They refused to be reasoned with, refused to believe me, refused to listen to anything I had to say, therefore proceeding to call me a liar and hung up the phone on me. Wow. How about that? I don't have to tell you what my first reaction was, do I? <laughs> I don't have to tell you what I wanted to do back, do I? Okay. Why? Because of that stupid teaching Victor did. 
ruined it for me. I was cocked and loaded, baby, for bear. And then that stupid teaching messes everything up for me right next, there it was, there it was, right next to my, my uh, righteous, hurtful and hateful thoughts were those other words, horrible words, like Romans 12, 14, bless them who persecute you. <laughs> there was my righteous indignation going, no, Spock, please, no, don't. You know, then my, I'm never talking to that mm -mm -mm again. He's never coming into this house. Right next to that, Romans 12, 17, never pay back evil for evil to anyone. What? <laughs> stupid teaching, stupid teaching. <laughs> then I'm like, and I'll tell you what, they ain't bless those who persecute you. <laughs> bless and curse not. Man, you messed up my day, brother, little brother. You did. I had it going on. Oh my gosh. But you don't understand. They were so mean to me. But I say unto you here, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. But I don't want to. You following me? This is, what am I talking about? I'm talking about a battle. I'm talking about a fight that goes on. And I'll tell you, what did they deserve from me? They didn't deserve nothing pretty. There was nothing pretty that they deserved. And if not for God, that's all they would have gotten is nothing pretty. If not for his words in my head that won over my words, if, if not for the reminder of all of my sins that have needed loving forgiveness, I would have lost the love battle, amen? And that's what it is. I would have lost the love battle if I had remained condemning and judgmental and self-righteously indignant. I would have lost that battle. That person would have lost probably respect for me for what I would have said. Um, God would have lost. That's who really would have lost. Because I'll tell you what, you would not have seen Jesus in me. You would have seen me in me. And I am full of me. And me never really helped anybody. And the me side that was coming out would have embarrassed Jesus Christ. Though I would have been righteous and justified because of what happened to me. So I could still say that I loved this person because I did still love this person. But the question wasn't whether I loved them. Now the question was, am I going to put my money where my mouth is? Am I, go I had to put my actions where my mouth is. Because to say you love somebody and then to act unloving is junk, right? Little children, 1 John says, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed. Do I have that one on there? But deed and truth. Do I have that? You got to check this one out, man. It's just, eh, eh. Oh, we don't need to, to watch that. Look, it's all about doing it, not just talking about it. Amen? It's let's not just talk about it with our tongues, but let's do it and be honest about it. So <laughs> that's the challenge, isn't it? I, that's, that's my challenge. Is, is anybody else like this? Thank you. There's three honest people in this church. <laughs> See, but do it in deed and truth, people. Um, so the question is, all right, it's not enough to say that I, I love. I had to actually do something about it. So the question isn't, should I love? Because we've already established we love God. We're supposed to love our neighbors. And now we're talking about loving our enemies. And not just saying I love them, but actually becoming loving to them. Now, who is my enemy? Well, you know, it's really interesting. Because if you answer the question, who is my neighbor? It's not the person who lives at 10 Benjamin Street. I live at 9. Right now, I'm not with them. I'm with you. Okay? So who is my neighbor is whoever I'm with. 
So if I'm to love my neighbor, I, can, I can't love my neighbor that lives at 10 Benjamin Street and be an idiot to you and say I'm loving God, amen? Oh, well, you're not my neighbor. I don't have to love you. Well, you're close enough. You're my neighbor now. So who, if, who is my enemy? Sometimes my enemy is the person who lives at 10 Benjamin Street, but sometimes it's also you. It's, frankly, it's whoever you're close to sometimes, isn't it? And sometimes it's who you're the closest to that becomes our enemies. It's our husband. It's our wife. It's our parents. It's our children. It's our boss. It's our friends. These are the people who have the ability to hurt you the most, amen? And these are the people who probably do. So these are the people who require the greatest lovingness when they hurt you because they are the greatest enemies I have ever had. And this is where the rubber meets the road about whether or not you're going to look like you or you're going to look like Jesus. Because Jesus died for the very people that were killing him. And one of my favorite things about that is that it says he was the just who died for the unjust that he might bring them unto who? He didn't die for them for any other reason. He didn't do it just because he loved them, just because it was his job. He did it for one reason, the just for the unjust, that he might bring them to God. The being the attitude, having the attitude, being the idiot that I really wanted to be and deserve to be and blah, 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 would never have brought this person to God. It would have driven them from me and therefore, by interpretation, their thoughts regarding God, even if they didn't know them, which they don't. Do you follow what I'm saying? There, it's a no-win situation. I don't give a darn what's happened to you. It's a no-win, nobody wins. And I don't believe that. I have a hard time believing that. When I'm in the middle of it, man, I'm telling you what, you're darn right, I'm gonna win. But you don't, do you? You know, the enmity, the enmity that you have in your, your mind, your brain, the hurts, you know, the thoughts, the I'm gonna get back, the blah, blah, blah. They, let's just talk about, can I just ignore them? Is that, is that loving? That's not even good enough. That's not being loving. That's being like everybody else. I'll just ignore them and hope they go away. You know, no. Jesus didn't ignore us. While we were yet sinners, Christ ignored us? That's when he died for us. That's crazy. People need to be loved the most when they deserve it the least. Can I get a ye amen on that? How about you? Right? Oh, Victor went through all these great verses. You know, do unto others as you would like them to do unto you. Normally I do, do unto others as they have previously done unto me. You know, but that's the, 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 uh, the. <laughs> you ain't nothing but a hound. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I want to do, I always want to do that mic thing. And it bounces back up. So, there you go. You got the Bible to tell you what it looks like. Everybody got a handout? All right, First Corinthians. I'm going the wrong direction, aren't I? This is what it looks like. So nobody can go, well, I'd like to be loving, but I can't because I don't know what it looks like, all right? The, God fixes that by giving you this handout today. OK, first let's look at 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8a. Love is what? Patient. Look up here. Look up here with me. Love is what? Kind is not what say him with me is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered. Good luck with that. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Whoa, 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 whoa. So it just told you all the things that it doesn't do. Now it's going to tell you what it does do. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, 
endures all things. Yeah, huh? Well, it's either the truth or it's lying, and I think it's the truth. So it's, we, the, the, yeah, the problem isn't with the words. The problem is with us. The problem is with the other words that are competing with these words within your head. Amen? It's those words that go, man, 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 man. You know, no, 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 you got to fight. Okay. You know, there's so many ways to go with this thing, but let me just say this. I've been doing this for a long time. I mean, a long time. You would think I would be better at this. I've been doing this for 30-something years, and I still had to fight. And the only way I, as a pastor, ooh, won that little love battle was because those words were fresh in my mind. Thank you, God and Victor, for teaching them that day. I swear, I believe that the situation that happened that day was just God so, go, you know, giving me an opportunity to see how this baby rolls. You know what I mean? It's like, let's see if this thing runs or not. Let's give them the car. Now give them the track to have to run it on. That phone call was my track, and the love of God was my vehicle. And I wanted, you know, and he's like, go ahead. Let's see how you do. Well, I, I won it, and then I lost it, and then I won it, and then I lost it, and then I, I was winning it, from, and then I lost it again. And then I, by the end of the day, hallelujah, I won. And instead of sending, you know, hate mail, I sent a letter of love, affirming my love and affirming God's love for this person that they really needed to believe that God loved them because maybe then they wouldn't be so sensitive and, you know, blah, 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 you know. And they showed up a couple of days later, you know, and everything's nice, nice with the nice. But, you know, to the glory of God, to the glory of God, you know. I'll tell you what. Thank you, God, for words. There is no substitute for these words in your head. Those of you who do not read your Bibles, okay, you are at a distinct disadvantage because you do not have them up here. Okay? It ain't some magic show. I'm just telling you, you're going to have crap up there no matter what because you are living in a fallen age. If you want to fight back, you cannot do it by thinking nice thoughts because, trust me, those nice thoughts aren't enough. The only way you're going to win this love battle is if you read your Bibles. If I had not heard that teaching on loving my enemies, this person didn't have a snowball chance in hell of getting anything but ire from me. You get it? So there's no substitute for reading your Bibles and then challenging your brain to actually do what it says. Reading it don't help you if you're not going to do it. So you cannot love just in word. Oh, I love God. Oh, I love you. Oh, I, you know, and then hate my enemy. I hate my brother, much less my enemy. I got to actually do it. How does love look? It looks like these things that you have. We're not going to go through them. I put them in a handout so that you could take them home and actually look at them. It's patient, okay? Quickly. You know, it means to be calm without complaint. Not one of my better traits. Not hasty or impetuous. Steadfast despite opposition, difficulty, or adversity. It denotes, I'm skipping through stuff. It denotes the state of mind which can bear long when it's oppressed, when it's provoked, and when one seeks to injure us. Wouldn't that be great? Now, the reason why I'm giving you these is because you need to know what it looks like because you have to copy them. So that when you see yourself doing things that aren't on this list, you can go, ooh, I'm off the list, OK? I need to get back on the list. All right, how about kind? Oh, you know what? That, that is a commodity, especially in Rhode Island. I'm serious. <laughs> you ask anybody who's a transplant here from the South, how you like it here? Well, people are just not very kind. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Especially if you're from the, I'm from the South. So you know, goodness me, you know, it's like, They'll do everything they possibly can, if you're in a market, to not look in your eyes. All of a sudden, the most interesting on the planet is the different types of Gatorade. <laughs> you know, when I come down the aisle going, hey, and they're like, well, Gatorade comes in 27 flavors. 
oh, she's gone now. I can, you know what I'm saying? Nobody wants to look at you. Nobody wants to be nice to you. Kindness is weird. They're going to think you're freaky. Forget talking about Jesus. Just don't slap them and they're going to think you're strange, you know? Be kind. What does it mean to be kind? It means to be gentle, having or showing a gentle nature and a desire to help others. Wow, conceptual. Not harsh. Not jealous. You know what jealousy is? This is interesting. It does not envy others, their happiness. Okay? When somebody is, succeeds, your temptation may be to go, well, how come that didn't happen to me? Oh, so-and-so got engaged. Well, how come that wasn't my turn? How come that didn't happen to me? Oh, so, so-and-so, you know, somebody got a great job. Well, I've been looking for a job. You see what I'm saying? All the, yeah. Now, that is not, that's, that's human nature. We want to get away from human nature. We want to get into God nature. It, we talk, this, what does the Bible say? The Bible says we rejoice with those who rejoice. rejoice. So when something good happens to somebody, you should not be jealous. You should be blessed for them. So one of the great reasons why you have this is you can check your head and go, whoa, I got real issues with this. Now, now it gives you something to pray about. And say, Lord, help me to be kind because I'm just a mean son of a gun. Does not brag. Oh, I would know nothing about this. Pompous or boastful statements, arrogant talk, self-focused talk. The idea is boasting and bragging. Now listen to this. This is stupid cool. This spirit proceeds from the idea of superiority over others and is connected with a feeling of contempt or disregard for them. In other words, I think I'm better than you. Now, there's nobody in this church that has the right mind that would say, yeah, I think I'm better than the person sitting next to me. Really? We, the way we speak and the way we think of others says that we are better. Oh, I know more Bible than that person. Oh, I've been around longer. My car is cooler. You know what I mean? Did that dress, oh, mine is so much nicer than theirs. The, just these thoughts that go through our head. Am I the only one who's this messed up? Do you guys ever deal with this stuff? OK, good, I'm just checking. No, hey, same three people are honest. It's amazing. <laughs> Dudes, we can like have a, uh, never mind. We'll, meet, we'll have a fellowship. Uh, it'll be the, uh, uh, the, the jealous, arrogant, unkind fellowship. Um, the great verse, 1 Corinthians 8, uh, says, uh, law, knowledge makes what? Arrogant, but love edifies. Isn't that cool? So, you know, while you're getting all this knowledge and while you're becoming so smart, do yourself a favor. Realize that you could be becoming arrogant, too. So the thing you need to stay would be the H word, hum. Go ahead. Humble. 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 Right. Okay. Just not act unbecoming. Not, uh, un you don't tell jokes at funerals. That's unbecoming. You understand? Because unbe when you act unbecoming is when you're rude. Because you're thinking about who? You. You're not thinking about the people around you. I'm telling you, if you would just think about the people around you, you would be more loving. I have never sinned being concerned about other people. I sin because I'm very concerned about me. Get it? It's amazing. Got a great little comment down here. There is so much that is indecent and unseemly in society that would be corrected by Christian love. Boy, do we live in an indecent society. Just what clothes people wear is, is unloving. Do you understand that? It ain't a matter of choice. It's a matter of loving or not. I wear something. Well, I'm the wrong person to talk about. A 17-year-old hottie wears something that exposes too much. That's not a matter of choice. That is a matter of being unloving. Because now they're forcing all the guys around them to have to renew their minds and not think evil. You understand? What is unbecoming is because people are focused on themselves instead of being focused on the people around them. Does that make sense? All right. Does not seek its own. It's obvious what that means. It's not selfish. It does not seek its own happiness exclusively. Yeah, you're supposed to try to get that better job. You're supposed to be happy. You're supposed to go on that cruise. You're supposed to have fun. You're supposed to, but not exclusively where it's only and always about who? You. That is seeking its own. Provoked. Well, you know, I don't know the answer to this. Some, some versions say not provoked. Some say not easily provoked. 
Well, you know what? I ain't looking for loopholes because I haven't figured out either in my life. Okay? So if you're already at that not easily provoked, then for you, you need to work on just not provoke. But for the rest of us humans, <laughs> we're still probably trying to figure out the not easily provoked part. Amen? The meaning of this phrase, that a man who is under the influence of love is not prone to violent anger or exasperation. It is not his character to be hasty, excited, or passionate, but is to be calm, serious, and patient. Does not take into account a wrong suffered. Like I said, good luck with that one. It will hide. The love of God will hide faults that appear and draw a veil over them instead of hunting them down and breaking them out to show everybody else. You understand that? You ever know people like that? Can't wait to see that you mess up so that they can point it out to everybody else. Did you hear what they said? I cannot believe it. Did you see what they're wearing? You know, that is, that is, that is, that is that's nasty. You know, I'll tell you what, what, you, what, what he said to me the other day, that really hurt me. And I want to tell you all about it so that you can be bothered by it too. Yeah. I'm, so, I'm so consumed by how they hurt me, I want to, to uncover that sin to everybody else. Oh, did you see what that pastor did? So, you know, let me tell you something about the love of God. The love of God covers. The love of God covers. And if you are one who likes to uncover people's sins and faults and failings, you do not yet understand the love of God. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness. It's not like, that's right. That, it, it doesn't wish ill to somebody. People, and I got a little note here, people of the world often find an unhealthy pleasure when somebody is brought low. You know what I'm talking about? And they talk about it at work, and they talk about, yeah, that's right, I knew he was an idiot. As he lost his job. It's about time, too, because I, you know what I mean? Where, yeah, he had it coming. Really? Oh, my gosh, if I got what I had coming, I would not, I'd be dead. And eternally that way. It's tempting to rejoice when an enemy or somebody who's, you know, a criminal even, is punished. But love doesn't rejoice in that. And that's hard. Oh, my gosh. But that's what it looks like. Now he's going to tell you what it is. It rejoices. What, is, what does the love of God do? It rejoices in the truth. It's glad of the gospel. The word truth here stands opposed to all the unrighteousness and, in, and iniquity. And it means that it's happy when it sees things that are done well. It's happy when it sees virtue and righteousness. Bears all things. Like I said, it hides and conceals things that should be concealed. What a loving thing to do to cover another's faults, amen? It believes all things. That doesn't mean you are a man of no conviction and blown about with every wind of doctrine. It means that you believe what is good and right in somebody until the very, where, where it's irrefragable and you can't any longer believe that that person really had your best interest at heart. You know what I'm saying? We, we are so quick to believe the worst of people. Let's try giving them the benefit of the doubt. Hopes all things. You know what? It hopes that everything is going to turn out well for you and for me. Love will hold to the hope and the hope of the return of Christ when, guess what? Everything will turn out well for you and for me. It endures all things. It bears up under this stuff, and it never fails. And here, this word, it never fails, it means love never falls away. It never just quits. There's never an end to it. It never gives up. In Corinth, Paul writes this to them. He says, earnestly desire what kind of gifts? Greater gifts. And this is talking about within the church, you know? Some speak in tongues and interpret. Some prophesy. Some have, you know, a gift of miracles. Some have the manifestations of discerning of spirits or whatever it is. The greater gifts. And then he says, but I'm going to show you something even cooler. Just because you have a gift to do something, you have a gift. Well, what if you're? What if the gift? Let's say you're the you're the you're the uh, prophecy guy, and you and you're the. Uh, well, let's do this. Simple. You're the coffee guy. And, and you're the 
chair straightener guy. Okay? Gifts within the church, you know, functions within the church. And um, it's, uh, it's midnight, and we have to get ready for the next meeting. Well, I might need both of you, actually. I'll need you to make some coffee and you to set up the chairs. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? You know, or let's say you're the musician, you know, and the situation is that there's a flood, and you're like, wait, I, I don't only play. I, I, don't, I don't help clean stuff up, you know. But that's my gift. My gift is I play music, and your gift is set up, you know. So now we have to set up. But he ain't going to help. But there's nobody else to help. Well, I don't do that because I'm, I play music. Well, what about if I need somebody in the band, you know, and you're not here? But that's not your particular gifting, but that's the need. If you love, guess what you're going to do? Give it a go. You're going to help to cover the need. That's why he's saying, yeah, you want to you seek all these good gifts so that you can function in the body of Christ. But I'll tell you what, if you don't, the, the love is the greater way to do this thing. Does that make sense? It's so cool. It, yeah, it makes it not about you. If I have the tongues of men and angels, but I don't have love, guess what? I'm worthless. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have all this faith so as to move mountains, but I don't have a love, what am I? Nothing. I am nothing. And if I give all my stuff to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned out in service, but do not have love, how much does it profit me? Nothing. nothing. Could it profit somebody else? Yes. Hey, if I have a bunch of good stuff and I give it to somebody, will that somebody be blessed? Yeah. yeah. How about me if I don't do it in love? No. no. So what the scriptures are saying isn't that what you do doesn't benefit anybody. What it's saying is that if you don't do it in love, guess who it doesn't benefit? You. It doesn't benefit you. It is when we do these things from our hearts that we are blessed. And God wants you to be blessed. Without true love, there is no benefit to the things that we do. Not now and not eternally. And the reason why I love this, love is therefore the more precious commodity that we have to go for. It's better than all the other acts and endowments that we have within the church. Nothing can take its place. And it's the one thing that everybody can give. No matter what your situation in life is, I don't care if you're rich, you're poor, you knew you've been around for a million years, I don't care if you're male, female, I don't care what your situation is, everybody is able to seek love and to be loving. One qualification, you have a heart. And as long as you have a heart, you can do what we're talking about. That's the only qualification. It totally evens out the playing field, doesn't it? And it says that when I was a child, I used to speak like a child. Amen? Goo goo gaga. But I grew up, I quit doing that. It seems kind of silly now, wouldn't it, to walk around going, duh, uh, yeah, good, gaga. You know what I'm saying? Wouldn't that be silly? Well, yeah. Let's get the point here. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. What is it talking about? It's talking about being unloving is really childish. It's just childish because childish things are all about me. The first words children learn besides mama and dada is mine. Mine. I want it. Mine. That's childish. And if you think about the issues in your life, you might be having some right now. They're not because you're being so concerned about other people. They're because of mine, me, what you did to me, mine. Okay? So the childish things are the things that are, Paul in, in this epistle is exhorting us to give up to put away, to grow up. He's just saying, dudes, let's grow up. Let's put away those childish things that make us and cause us to be unloving, all of our self-concerns and our self-conceit. And let's, it says, 
do away with them. Verse 12, for now we, we only see in a mirror dimly. I mean, you don't, you don't know how the things that you choose are going to affect somebody. But then face to face, I, now I know in part, but, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. Faith, hope, love, abide these three, but the greatest of these is what? Honestly, being unloving is childish. And I know that in my own life. I see that in my own life. And it's embarrassing, isn't it? And it's only when we grow up that we can see that love is the great and necessary goal that we should be pursuing. It's as we grow up that we become like Christ. And we can put away these childish things and put on the glue, the perfect bond of perfectness. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the what? Perfect bond of unity. Lord, I'm asking that you would help us today. That you would help us to put these things away, these stupid things. Oh my gosh, they're just really stupid. It's, it's like, help us to get into a higher place so that when we can look down at our childish ways, we see them for what they are. We see that jealousy is childish. We see that arrogance is childish. We see that our hurts, that our sins are all rooted in self. Help us to see that. Help us to get up and on top so we can look down and see that and choose to grow up, God. We need to grow up so we can glorify you and serve Christ and show other people what that looks like, Father. And I know that we owe a great debt we ask that you would help us to repay that debt, the debt of love, not just in word, but in deed and in truth. Totally need your help on this. We're asking, we're asking, we're asking. In the name of Jesus Christ, can I get an amen? Amen. amen.